Hello, my name is Bill Chow, and welcome to the webinar on production code generation and verification for the automotive industry. Here's a brief agenda for today's presentation. In the first portion, we'll start off with an introduction and talk about the key products and capabilities for production code generation, including showing a basic demo that highlights some of these capabilities. In the second portion, We'll talk about more advanced features for automotive customers. We'll also show a couple of demos highlighting some of these capabilities. We'll then end the presentation and take your questions from the audience. Here is a representation of the embedded system that we are designing for. Inside of Simlink, we have our plant or environment model and also our controller or application. We can run simulations for the entire model and also generate code for the entire model. Alternatively, we can generate code just for the plant to run HIL or hardware in the loop testing or generate code just for the controller and do some rapid prototyping. The focus of the presentation today is on generating code for a controller or application from which point you can then embed it onto your ECU or embedded control unit. With the MathWorks tools, we do not provide compilers or linkers, and our focus is on the simulation, code generation, and verification of the generated code with our simulation model. We'll talk more about the verification aspect using a technique called processor in a loop testing later in this talk. MATLAB is our core product and it is the platform on which our numerical computations are carried out. It allows us to do data analysis and also plot our data for visualizations. Simlink is a block diagram and state machine environment for you to create your entire system model. Using Simlink, you can create video image processing algorithms for applications such as lane departure warning systems. You can also design controllers for powertrain applications, perhaps for hybrid vehicles. Regardless of what you choose to design, you can use the code generation products to generate nice ANSI C code for your algorithms. Using real-time workshop, you can generate code from MATLAB and Simulink that's easy to interact and experiment with. For example, you can generate code for rapid prototyping, at which point you can tune the parameters in real time and also log signals for data analysis. For these type of rapid prototyping applications, extra code is needed for us to tune the parameters and also log signals. For production code generation, we want more streamlined code, and so Real-Time Workshop Embedded Coder will enable you to generate more streamlined and customizable NCC code. Some of these options include function calling interfaces, adding comments, and generating data structures. Real-Time Workshop Embedded Coder is an add-on product to Real-Time Workshop. MathWorks also provides a set of products called the Embedded ID Link and Target Support Package that offers microprocessor and compiler toolchain specific targets. The links and targets offer things like device drivers and automatic project creation. There are also a variety of third-party companies that using the MathWorks links and targets APIs have created their own custom links and targets that target specific microprocessor and compiler toolchains. Regardless of whether or not you use the links and targets, you can take the code that is generated from your Simlink models and deploy it on any microprocessor because the code that is generated is in standard C and C++. In fact, many of your customers do exactly just that, and we refer to this process as algorithm export. Let me show you a brief demonstration of our code generation capabilities. Here we have a simple model where we design our system using three domains. 
first one being Simulink and here we have a simple feedback controller using standard Simulink blocks our game block and our delay block the second is our embedded MATLAB function block and here using the MATLAB language we are able to represent some complicated algorithms in just a one line of MATLAB code and we're able to do that because MATLAB uses matrices as its base data type so we are able to operate on a large number of data in just one function call in this case this is just doing a simple addition if we generate C code for this block we'll see that one line of MATLAB code actually requires several lines of C code and finally this is our stateful block and this is the way to model state machines in this case this is a very simple state flow model where we are modeling some predicate logic in the default case we are outputting a specific value but we are also checking uh, one of our inputs C and if it's greater than one then we would output twice the input in essence the input for this model is coming in from variables a b and c which can be inputted using a data file or a mat file in this case we actually have encompassed this entire model inside of a test harness and our inputs are coming in from our signal builder block and you can see the inputs the three inputs that's going into our system so we can go ahead and simulate our system and we can see our output on the right and also we can take a look at the state flow chart and we can see that different decisions are being outputted based on the input value C and here is our final result once you've tweaked your design so that it satisfies your requirements you can move to the next step and start generating code for your design you can generate code for subsystems like so or you can generate code for the entire model which we will now do right now we've generated code for rapid prototyping purposes and if you take a look at the C code you can see that there are over 600 lines of code but if you look at the code a little bit more closely you'll see that most of it is code for data logging and also comments on what the generated code is being generated from inside of your Simulink model so the code was generated using real-time workshop and if your application is for rapid prototyping this type of code would be appropriate for your application however if we're looking to do production code we would want more streamlined code so we would pick another target in that case to do that we would generate code using real-time workshop embedded coder here you see that we're now using the real-time workshop embedded coder and if you look a little further down you will see that we have far more options than we did with standard real-time workshop one of the easiest ways to set and specify how our code is generated is using the code generation objectives here we can specify objectives such as generating code for execution efficiency and traceability other objectives like RAM and ROM efficiency safety precaution and debugging is also available so once we've set our objectives we can go ahead and check our model before we start generating code this is useful to see if there are any issues or settings that we need to change to our model before we generate code so we can check our entire model 
But in this case, since we're generating code just for the ECU, I'm just going to So here is our report. So within our report, we have several items that were flagged. So let's take a look. The first one is checking our configuration settings. And here's a listing of parameter values that is not optimized for the um, objectives that we set, which is execution efficiency and traceability. So here are our current values and recommended values from this model checker. We can go through all of these and an easier way is that there is an automatic way of changing all of these to our recommended values. If we click on this it will do just that. Let's do that again. Okay, so that was done. Let's take a look at the next one. Here it says that our hardware implementation was not set, as it's highlighted here. So let's go ahead and set something there. And right now we've actually set our code to be generated for a generic um, device that's actually not specified. So it's always a good practice to set uh, a particular processor that we're generating code for. And you can see we have quite a number of options. So let's go ahead and generate for free scale processor and we can stick with the 32-bit PowerPC. So we've set that. Let's come back and we can run the check again once we've made our changes. If we take a look at the software environment specifications, since we check, since we've changed the hardware, let's go ahead and just run this check again. That should be done. And here is another warning about blocks that generate expensive saturation and rounding code. Actually, since we just changed the hardware, let me run this check again. And sure enough, one of the two errors was removed because that was related to the hardware. But our other warning is regarding um, code that protects against division uh, arithmetic exceptions. So we can read through that and we can actually just remove the code. We can remove the code that protects against division arithmetic exceptions. And we can run that check again. And here we've also just passed that. We can go ahead and just run that check on that first warning that we had. And now we can see that our model has passed all these checks. So we should be able to generate uh, code without running into some of these different issues. So now we're ready to generate code, and we can go ahead and just do that now. So here's the code generation report. And one of the first things that you'll see is that it lists the code generation objectives, in this case for execution efficiency and traceability. And traceability is quite important when we work with model standards. If we take a look at the generated C code, you see that we have or less code. And in fact, a lot of it is our input code that's being generated. In fact, that's for our test harness, the initialization code for that. And also, much of the code is actually comments. And these comments are quite important for traceability. And in fact, when we selected the code generation objective, 
um, traceability for our, our code generation objective, it automatically generates these comments and these comments provide a way for us to trace code back to the model. And we can click on these hyperlinks and this will highlight the blocks in which the code was generated from. Some of these other ones such, are, such as our embedded MATLAB block. We can highlight that. And we can also go the other way from within our model if we want to say trace this particular block to our code. You can see that uh, when we do that the uh, code that's associated with that game block is automatically highlighted and you can see um, where these pieces of code resides. So traceability is quite important for modeling standards and also for in-house uh, code standards as well. And here we have a traceability report showing you some of the um, eliminated blocks or virtual blocks. We also have a code interface report and this shows how you can um, interface with the generated C code with your other uh, larger embedded software code. And we also have a subsystem report which talks about different uh, code mappings. And actually in our code interface report you'll notice that much of our code actually uses uh, the void which you can see here and we can actually change that behavior through one of the options inside of our interface pan we can generate reusable code if that's what you're looking for and we can pass the root level IOs as structures if that's not what you're looking for we can this feature here and we can actually specify our model interface We'll validate that. And here you see that we have three inputs and two uh, outputs. And right now our inputs are all passing by value. And we can pass by reference if we wanted to do that. Similarly for our outputs, we can pass by value if we wanted to uh, do something like that. And we can change when we're using passing by reference whether to do const or const to const and we can go ahead and change our outputs to this particular uh, function prototype so these are some of the different options that you will be able to use when you are using real-time workshop embedded coder and if you are new to the tool you can use the um, code generation objectives and these model advisor checks um, to generate code for the objectives that you're looking for and these few buttons will get you uh, right along the way so that's the end of this basic demo and let's head back to our PowerPoint slides so moving along one of the questions that people ask is how well the automatically generated code compares to hand code. So here's a paper that Visteon wrote several years back where they took a Simulink model and compared the results of the automatically generated code with hand code. So in this report I'm sure they went through and tried uh, several different options and the automatically generated code will depend on the settings that you choose in the code generation settings. But you can see here that in addition to the code being both readable and verifiable, the efficiency of the automatically generated code is comparable to hand code in terms of ROM and RAM um, sizes. 
This report also takes a look at the fixed point aspects of code generation and the results there are quite similar. Another question that people will often ask is what type of support the MathWorks has for different software safety standards. For example, the DO178B, which is a popular safety standard for the aerospace industry, or for the automotive industry, IEC 61508, which actually was developed for industrial automation, but has been used in the automotive, automotive industry as well. And a derivative of that, ISO 26262, which is currently in draft form, and MISR C, which is a set of C code guidelines for the automotive industry. And for all these standards, MathWorks offers some product support and documentation on how to use model based design for these software standards. And in today's presentation, we'll focus uh, a little more on ISO 26262 towards the uh, latter part of the presentation. So continuing on with this first portion of the presentation, I'd like to outline some of the key production code generation capabilities. So you've definitely seen this V diagram before. And one thing that we want to highlight is that production code generation is not something that you do at the end of the process. In fact, you can do it um, much earlier in the process. For example, in the simulation phase, you can generate code, uh, production code, to accelerate your simulation. You can generate code for rapid prototyping on a real-time computer, or you can generate code for on-target rapid prototyping. And in this case, you are generating code that will run on the actual processor. Um, and if you have the actual hardware available, for example, on a fleet of um, automobiles, you can actually try out the code on the actual target. And towards the verification aspect, you can run software in the loop testing, processor in the loop testing, and also hardware in the loop testing on the actual uh, system to verify your uh, design. As you go down the V cycle, you first start with your high level requirements, whether that is indoors or in a Word document. And once you create your symlink model and generate your code, you're able to trace between the code and the model. Traceability is uh, quite important in this aspect. And if you have the product, Simlink verification and validation, you would be able to trace between Simlink and your high level requirements. This provides a bi directional tracing between your high level requirements and the C source code. As you move along, you can then create your system design model with your controller and your plant. And you can run simulations for both your nominal simulation and your failure mode simulation. And of course, the test cases here should be requirement based. You can go one step further and do more detailed system designs. In fact, reusing the same model in your software design model. And again, you would run your test cases for nominal simulation and failure simulation. Reusing that model yet again, you can specify your subsystem specifications. You could also convert your model from flowing point over to fixed point uh, using a product called Simlink Fixed Point. When you convert your model, you do not need to change your model. You simply need to change the data types from the default uh, flowing point values that is used in your original Simlink model. With Simulink Fixed Point, there's a tool called the Fixed Point Advisor that will help you convert your flowing point model into a fixed point model. The Fixed Point Advisor is similar to the Simulink Model Advisor I showed you earlier when we were generating code. In addition, you can also specify your function and file partitioning at the subsystem level, as you can see here. From there, you need to specify the target that you're generating code for. Uh, you could be generating for an Autozar target, for example, 
or you could be picking a specific target processor that you are looking to uh, embed your algorithm code onto. And from there, once you've made your selection, you can go ahead and generate code as I showed earlier in the basic demo. Keep in mind that the code generated by Real-Time Workshop Embedded Coder is your algorithm and logic code. And you may have other legacy algorithm code that you want to interface uh, with this code. And we have tools that will allow you to take your legacy algorithm code and plug that into the algorithm code generated by Real-Time Workshop Embedded Coder quite neatly. And we can talk about that a little bit more. In addition, you will need to take this uh, code that's generated and plug it into your scheduler or operating system of your embedded uh, software. If you recall the model interface tool that we looked at earlier, where we changed the uh, void step function, uh, in particular the inputs and the outputs, from passing by value to passing by reference, that tool may be quite useful for you as you modify that model interface in order to fit into your scheduler or operating system. And with that algorithm code, you will need to interface with your other device drivers uh, that is used on your embedded system. If you're looking for a push button target that takes care of all the details for you, we have the embedded ID link and target support package products, as well as various third party tools as you can see here, uh, for specific targets. And you can read more about it at this particular link. So having generated your code, you need to verify that the behavior of the code matches what you wanted it to do. So we'll take a look at some verification and validation capabilities. And while it's a large subject, we'll limit ourselves to component verification and validation. Recall that we have your high-level requirements, and you can trace that to your design model. In addition, you can also trace it to test cases. We have a block called the signal builder block in which various different types of input signals can be traced to your high-level requirements. And you want to make sure that you come, come up with uh, the correct test cases in order to test your model. With your design model and your test cases, you would then go ahead and start running your tests. And you want to make sure that your design will satisfy these different test cases. And as you go through these, you should be able, at the end of the day, to come up with a coverage report. And the coverage report should show that each part of your model has been covered. For example, was every state reached? and if each if-else statement was covered. And you want to make sure that your model is fully covered. And model coverage, which you can get using the Simlink verification and validation product, will help you with that. In addition, if it turns out that your test cases was not uh, sufficient and several different parts of your model was not covered using the test cases that you specified, you can use the Simlink Design Verifier product that will help to augment with automatically generated test cases. So at this point, you have a golden reference model with full coverage and also full functional testing. So from here, you can go ahead and generate your code and rerun the same tests either in a software in a loop testing um, approach in which case the code is actually running on your host machine. Or you can run the code on the actual target processor using processor in loop testing. And in this case, the algorithmic code would be running on the target processor while your test inputs and the outputs are coming in from Simlink. And in addition to running formal analysis on the generated code, you can also apply polyspace code verification on your legacy code, which may never have gone through formal methods, and you would be able to detect runtime errors on your legacy code as well. And if you're looking to see if your code satisfies Minnesota C uh, standards, you can also uh, get that report 
using the polyspace code verification. Let us now move into the second portion of this presentation and talk about some of the more advanced features you may find useful in your automotive designs. In particular, we will take a look at the new features introduced in release 2009B, which was released in September of 2009, and in R2010A, which was released in March of 2010. We'll take a look at six sets of new features. We'll start off by talking about some code efficiency enhancements and then talk about code verification enhancements that we've made. We'll then take a look at new features in our fixed point design and also take a look at our updated AutoZar support. Finally, we'll talk more about MathWorks support for IEC 61508 and in particular for ISO 26262. One of the code efficiency enhancements we made involves bus assignments and multi-port switches. This is a popular modeling pattern where the bus assignment block is put in series with a switch block. If we take a look at the generated code, in previous releases, you can see that there is extra memory and extra copies in the generated code. In release 2010, these redundant memory and copy operations are eliminated, thus reducing RAM and ROM usage and increasing execution speed. We're continuing to improve the code that is generated from embedded MATLAB functions. In this example, you can see that we have an input value, this variable A, and all we're doing is multiplying the ninth element by 10 and our output is simply this variable A. In previous releases of MATLAB when you generated code you see that there is quite a number of redundant operations that is generated for this particular algorithm. However in release 2009B the redundant operation is eliminated thereby reducing redundant data copies which means that we reduce the overall memory usage and we can generate more concise code. In release 2010A, you can specify the maximum stack size for your model. This helps to reduce RAM and ROM consumption by removing unnecessary global variables for large signals. In this example model, you can see that within this for loop, we have a variable b.gain2 and it has a size of 513. This consumes quite a bit of global memory. When we specify the maximum stack size, the global memory is eliminated and instead replaced with a local variable, rtb underscore gain underscore zero, and this allows the algorithm to proceed as needed without consuming a large amount of global memory. This will help to improve execution speed of your algorithm. Moving on to the code verification features, the software in the loop and processor in the loop simulation modes have been updated. So now you can run software in the loop testing for your entire model. You can also run software in the loop testing for individual subsystems using the model block. There's no need to modify your model and you can reuse the test harness for the original model on the generated code. When verifying your algorithm, we talked about measuring model coverage using the Simlink verification and validation software earlier in this presentation. When you run software in the loop testing, it is also important to measure code coverage during SIL co-simulation. You can now do this using third-party tools such as Bullseye Coverage from Bullseye Testing Technologies. This tool will support collecting cumulative coverage data from multiple software in the loop simulation runs. For those of you working with fixed point designs, we have two tools, the fixed point advisor and the fixed point tool that help you convert your flowing point models into fixed point models and further refine and optimize your fixed point designs. We have made several enhancements to these two tools 
to provide better overflow handling and improve precision, and also detecting potential numeric problems in the fixed point tool. So let me show you a quick demonstration of the fixed point tool. Here I have a model. It's a fairly simple model with two inputs. The first one being an array of constants. Each of these constants have a value of pi over 2 or about 1.57 and our second input has a value of 3. Our output is actually being selected from our inputs and what happens is that the first input, the arrays of 1's, are being selected by our second input. So if we run the simulation, you can see that our output has a value of 2's. And this is different from what we expected because our initial input should have values of pi over 2 or about 1.57. Now the reason for that is when we look at the fixed point data type, we see that this data type is an int32. So there are no bits to represent the fraction bits. And that's why we're getting values of 2. So the fixed point tool can help us fine tune our fixed point data lengths. In order to fine tune the fixed point data lengths, what we need to do first is to find the maximum numerical range of our inputs. So we already set up our four uh, blocks in our models to log signals, as you can see with these icons here. So one of the neat features of the fixed point tool is that we can very quickly override all the data types in our model over to flowing point. And once we've overrode the uh, data types into flowing point, we would be able to find the maximum numerical range of our inputs. So I'm just going to run that simulation. And if we take a look at our model, you see that this time around we get the proper output values. So given that, the fixed point tool can then propose fraction lengths for us to uh, take a look at. You can see constant and constant 1 which are our two inputs and originally we specified for constant uh, for constant that there are no fraction bits and the fixed point tool from the simulation it proposes to have 30 fraction bits. Now we can choose to accept it and we can also choose to modify it as we see fit. For example uh, based on some other uh, data, maybe design data, you want to give it 20 fraction bits or 12 fraction bits or 20 fraction bits. In this case, we'll stick with the original 30 fraction bits. And if you look at the second input, originally it was uh, an int 8, and based on the simulation inputs, the fixed point tool knows that um, there were no overflows or underflows, and so it does not change the fraction bits and it does not automatically tell you to accept uh, any sort of new proposed data types. So we'll go ahead and accept the uh, proposed fraction lengths. So you see that now the actual fraction lengths has been inputted. So our first input now has 30 fraction bits. And we're going to turn off the data type override and switch it back to our original fixed point data types. So if we run the simulation again, you see that this time around the first input now has uh, 30 fraction bits and our second input remains uh, in int 8. The fixed point tool can also give you the ability to create difference plots for your signals in your model and if you're working on more complex models that feature will come in quite handy for you as you compare your different fixed point scalings and as you go through several iterations of fine tuning your fixed point data lengths. Coming back to the PowerPoint slides, one of the other enhancements that we've made is to add AutoZar compiler abstraction. For those of you who are not familiar, AutoZar is an automotive standard that describes how software components should be architected and integrated. 
We've supported AutoZar for several releases, and this is one of the enhancements that we've made. When you turn this option on, you can see that we add in the abstraction macros, var and func,t in the generated code. This lets you configure near-far placements, so you can choose the location of the data and code on a per-software component basis. This and other enhancements we've made over the years shows our continuing support of AutoZar. Moving on, I mentioned support for IEC 61508 and ISO 26262, and the MathWorks has produced a product called the IEC Certification Kit for customers who are looking to certify their designs for these two standards. The ISO 26262 standard is currently in draft form and was derived from IEC 61508. The IEC certification kit includes several certification artifacts for these two standards. The certification was done by the TÜVSUD organization and they are a well-known certification authority based in Germany with many offices around the world. The TÜVSUD certified real-time workshop embedded coder and also the polyspace verification products. They also provided a certification certificate and a report that describes the certification. The report also mentions the need for a verification and validation workflow and this workflow is described in the IEC certification kit. In release 2009B, we released a traceability matrix that helps you to capture the model to code traceability requirements information. The kit also includes templates for things such as software to a qualification plan and all these other templates. Tool qualification can be claimed by customizing the tool qualification package and referencing the certificate and certification report. So that wraps up our presentation. If you have the product already, you can take a look at some of these new features and demos by looking at RTW demos. You can also take one of our code generation classes where instructors will lead you through several examples and exercises to help you learn more about embedded code generation. If you're looking for some customized consulting effort to kickstart your design project, you can contact your local sales representative who may suggest the Embedded Coder Jumpstop service. The MathWorks is deeply committed to supporting production code generation, as you can see by the large number of features that we are introducing for production code generation. Tom Ekinen and myself will be on the line to answer some of your questions, so if you have any questions, now's a good time to send those in. Thank you very much.